Uh, I think today we will talk about somewhat simple, at the same time interesting uh, practice uh, and supposed to be present in our, in our field. But unfortunately, unfortunately up to now, uh, I hope and I talked before with Dr. Ammar to supply us by some experts to change us how to deal with agitated patient in a way other than we did before. We have a traditional way of management of agitation in casualty or in acute wards. Uh, that traditional way that we just, uh, when we interview the patient and just find him agitated, we shut down the interview and asking for two things. If the patient in casualty, we give him medication and admission. In case of admission in size award, we just give him medications and physical restraint. We have no other choice. Whatever the type of agitation, whatever the underlying cause of agitation, the same policy we did with most of the patients, we did with them. So this way of all the fashion or traditional way of management, is that correct in the most of the cases? I mean that most of the cases evaluated by the doctor or nurse staff, and the agitated behavior is markedly present and the market sign of the patient. The only solution that restrain and giving medication and admission, the number of level one observations in our hospital is too much. One of the main causes of level one observation is the violent and the aggression and the agitated patient. So, because of this way, we admit the patient and number of admission increased because of agitation. The number of the cases of physical restraint is increased. The using of injection is too much. The RCB medical uh, board it is also increasing because of involuntary admissions. One of the main causes of involuntary admission is agitation. So there is a question. If there is no other solutions other than this way of management, which had drawback by increasing the number of admission, increasing the length of admission, increasing the restraint, the quality of the surface sometimes has a stigma because of we are the hospital which is restraining the patients. And this is against, I mean, our quality of surface. So what can we do? Actually, restrain and medication of a patient, it is one of the steps. We cannot ignore it. it is, it's important. But within certain limit of agitation. So we have major limit of agitations. We can use other way of, of management other than medications and restraint and admissions. What is that? It is, a practical, it is a practical way of interview of agitated patients to solve and escalating him to the quality of calmness. It means that the therapist, doctor, psych psychiatrist, I mean, or nurse staff in a casualty or in a ward, supposed to have a skills of interviewing the agitated patients with the goal in his mind of the doctor that I want to make him calm down and calm. At the same time, no need for medications and no need for physical restraint or even admission. How can we do it? Of course, this policy it is present in some of, of uh, I mean, international psychiatric hospital. But unfortunately, we have no this practice in our hospital and we hope to find some experts to train us and to train the nervous staff how to deal with the agitated patient because agitation has mild level, moderate level, and a severe level. So we can deal this practical way of escalating the patients in a mild and moderate level, and we can use the physical restraint and medications in a severe types of agitation. The traditional methods of treating agitation patients, which is usually the routine restraint and involuntary medications, have been replaced with much greater emphasis on non-corrosive uh, approach. The traditional goal of calming the patients often has a dominant submissive connotation. 
Actually, what, what, what exactly did in a casualty or in the world that the doctor evaluates the condition and he diagnosed it as, a, as agitation and he is ordering to the nurse staff to restrain and giving medications to the patient. And the patient passively received this way of, of management. So the doctor in a dominating way and the patient in a submissive way and just receiving the way of management. This relationship has a negative feedback on a patient himself. How? This way of, it's, it's a matter of sedation, it's not a matter of calmness. So the patient's coming again to the same way as before and became again agitated, sometimes escalating this agitation to reach the aggression and attacking the doctor, attacking the nurse staff, or damage any things <coughs> or items in, in the environment and the area. So sometimes this old fashioned way has a negative view uh, to the patients and to the staff, doctor or nurse staff, or even to the environment, which is a hospital. So uh, the, the contemporary goal of helping a patient calm himself, it is one of the collaborative. This is the recent way of, of uh, or uh, I mean, the best way of dealing with agitation, uh, that you make the doctor and the patient, the relation between them during the interview, it's a matter of collaboration, and the doctor, he has a goal in his mind, and the nurse staff has a goal in his mind, that I need to calm this patient by certain skills and certain ideas, to reduce his emotion, to reduce his behavior, and even to overcome the idea coming in his head, which is threatening, aggressive, or agitated idea. Agitation. Agitation, which is commonly seen in our work. Agitation, it is an acute emergency state. Of course, we are dealing with the emergency situations. And the doctor dealing with, with agitation is supposed to have certain skills which is not present in the other psychiatrist doctor. This is what, for example, rapid assessment. He needs to take short time to assess the patients. This assessment, including history, causes of agitations, and what can we do with the patients. At the same time, he takes a decision, rapidly taking a decision, how to manage these situations in a very short. Otherwise, the patients may be escalating to from the stage of agitation, for example, he's anxious, followed by agitation, followed by aggression. If he couldn't take, a, I mean, uh, the, the, the proper time to assess and to, to take a decision to manage the case, the case may be out of our hand. Uh, according to the level of agitation, we have three levels. And the patient can be fluctuating easily at any time, any moment, any second. He can be fluctuating from mild to moderate to severe, according to the environmental situations, according to the interview between the patients and the nurse staff, and even with the psychiatrist. So either escalate or escalate our sufficient fluctuating to the more aggressive uh, level of agitation. By the way, the number of visits of agitated patients to the, to the, I mean, psychiatry, in, for example, in USA in 2016, it's about 2 million visits. So there's a major cases visiting emergency of psychiatry because of agitation. And 21% of these visits due to schizophrenia, and about 13% due to bipolar. And also agitations represented about 52% of the patients treated by treated in psychiatric emergency. So more than half of the cases coming to the emergency in USA because of agitation. But fortunately, 47% of them treated by medication, which means that there is 53% of the cases treated by other things other than medications, which is this practice of discretion. Clinically, the doctor or the nurse staff in a, casual, in a casualty or in the ward should be assessed the patients. What are the signs? What are, I mean, the clinical signs you observe it for the patients? And what is the level of agitation that the patient uh, he has? For example, in the stage, mild stage, the patient has, which is called an anxiety and agitation, a stage the patient is nervous, angry, frustration, suspicious affect, pacing, restless, footing, taping, clenching fist, and loud shouting, screaming, fasting in his talk, demanding, and many things we can observe. This is a verbal way of agitation. At that moment, he can take a, I mean, a solutions of stop 
interview, just giving him a time to relax and then you can continue interview or using the practice of discretion in this stage. The second stage, which, uh, which is moderate, in which the patient starts to verbally treat the staff or the doctor using more advanced way of aggressions like clenched fist or jaw, glaring, sweetening, menacing, posturing, invading the space, swearing, demanding, specific threats, personal, even attack. And most of us subjected to like this level of situation. Even this level of situations, you can discreet your patient if you are practicing well, how to discreet the threatening patient in this level. And no need for injection, no need for restraint, no need for admission, no need for level one observation. After that, which is a severe level, this is a level of severe aggression. A wide range of behavior, including hitting, kicking, beating, spitting, damaging of the property, and uh, patients may be using, for example, weapons or something, items in, in the hospital, they can attack, and at this difference, we couldn't, I mean, control by discretions. This is a stage only we can take in medications, admissions, restraint, whatever the policy be. So two thirds of the types of aggressions we can use in the escalation technique and one third only we can use in that of um, the old way of, of management, which is sedations and admission or physical restraint. During the interview of the patient, if you can talk with the aggressive or trained will to talk with the aggressive patients, you can determine which type of aggression he has. For example, there are three types, for example, there is many types of aggression, there is many causes of aggressions, and the risk factor of aggression is too much, but this is not a place for talking about the aggression by itself, but we are talking about how to deal with the most of the cases of aggression. For example, in instrumental aggression, we saw some patients threatening, he threatening to take something. If you will not bring me something like this, I will do like this. It's one of the, I mean, uh, type of aggression we can face. In, uh, we can ask the nurse or staff or even the doctor in, in patient, uh, the, the nurse or staff coming and sitting that the patient certainly was aggressive because he wants some demands, but we didn't, I mean, give him this. Uh, that's why he's aggressive and attacking the nurse or staff or attacking the doctor or even attacking the other patients or damaging something or in items and so forth. Uh, this is called instrumental aggression and we should determine the type of aggression because we think how to solve the cause of behind the aggression. Uh, sometimes fear, excessive fear from something which is not real. Uh, we saw many psychotic patients fear. He can attack anyone because of fear, fear from for example, due to delusions or due to hallucinations, and he's acting with delusions or hallucinations. That's why he's attacking fear. This is unreal, but it is a type of aggression. How to deal with this excessive fear? It is also a practice of discretions. Irritable aggressions, which is, can happen in acute stage. For example, one patient attacked by another patient, or he's feeling hurt by some monthly, and he wants to attack this man who hurt him. It's a type of aggression, and we can see if uh, there is also some patients, and I know one of these patients uh, that he has a chronic, frequent attack of aggressive behavior against sometimes the staff, sometimes the doctor, sometimes the visitor, or even the other patients. Uh, and when you ask what you did like this, he said, "Excuse me, uh, I, I did it involuntarily, out of my hand. I'm sorry, fair. I did it because the voice told me to, to do it. Fair. Okay, we increase the medications and we're doing a lot of effort to do this. No, it's never stopped. Fair. What can we do? It is a chronic behavior of attacking the patients or attacking the others <coughs> due, to, due to something the patients cannot control it. This is a chronic type of irritable aggression. Fair. So, what can we do now? Fair? We will follow the old-fashioned way that we, every patient agitated, we can do the same policy of giving medication and restraint or admission, or what can we do if there is any other solutions. The negative stigma of frequent sedations and admissions, it's too much. The number of admissions of the cases in our hospital is too much. Dr. Ammar, from time to time, giving us like 
uh, alarmed that the number of the cases too much try to, I mean, discharge the patient as we can. One of the causes of admissions, especially that of involuntary admissions, is accretion. So every case and each one case coming to the casualty we will admit because of accretion, or we can handle these situations as we can because of we are precise well to do this, I mean, discretions. Can we, I mean, reduce the number of admission? Can we reduce the number of agitation because aggression or agitation it is easily escalated to aggression and the length of admission too much from one month after that RCB the vision is still aggressive and it's not good okay extended to another month and another month and so on so the length of admission is equally going hand by hand with the aggressions and the number of admissions is also equal hand by hand so we will ask ourselves what's the solution the solution in the verbal discretion verbal discretion it's not a matter of talking to the patients without training no it's a matter of training it's a matter of goal directed you have objectives when you are when you start to discreet your patients it is like psychotherapy so we will train it. We need some experts to train us in our hospital to discreting and the calming. The therapist is calm. The therapist has an idea in his mind. The doctor wants to transmit this idea coming in his mind to the patient and his feeling to the patient. It is a matter of infectious attitude from the, ther from the doctor or the nurse staff to the patient. Because the patient is aggressive he has abnormal behavior, he has abnormal idea, he has abnormal feeling. Otherwise, the, the, the patients will infect the, the therapist. So which one is was winner? That of trained, well-trained, I mean, uh, doctor or well-trained nurse staff, he can easily overcome these problems in, in whatever setting, OBD or in casualty or, uh, I mean, uh, acute admission wards. So three-step approach should be mind or should be present. This is the theoretical, theoretical I mean, background of discretions, but we need the practical uh, practice and the training of this way. There's a three-step approach by that of, uh, I mean, psychiatrists or nurses, stuff to do with the patient. You should start by verbally engaging with the patient. Can we do it? Can we verbally engage the agitation patient? If we can, okay, this is the beginning of our work to solve the problem. The second, to make good rapport with the patients and a good, I mean, collaborative relationship to be established. Can we do it? Can we do it with agitation patient, with agitated patient, to make good rapport with the patients? We can do it, of course, because almost of us have, I mean, a high experience, with, but with a little number, not with the most, our major number of agitated patients. And finally, after you, engage verbally with the patients and making this good relationship starts to but I mean or invade the mind of the patients and to putting the escalating way of management inside the mind of the patients. At that time the patient will receive it in a proper way and they became calm down. Why you are doing discretions? Of course we have goals to doing it. Because what, for example, what are these goals to ensure the safety? Agitations sometimes followed by many others. Injury of the nurse staff, attacking the doctors. Me, I attacked by one patient before in OBD. Suddenly he opens the door and attacked me and <laughs> he's highly sporty and cutting my, 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 my clothes. I, it was upset. So safety, safety of the patient, safety of uh, the area and the probability and also safety of the nurse staff and the safety of the psychiatrist. <coughs> so we started to train ourselves to this, to save the patient first and to, to save even myself first and also to save the property and the nursing staff. That's number one, to help the patient managing his emotion and distress. Of course, if we are discreting the patients in a frequent sessions, he can learn it. The new behavior, how to discreet himself which is a matter of like that of behavioral therapy. Avoid use of restraint. Yes, if we restrain, it means medications, it means admission, it means level one, it means uh, RCB medical board. Avoid that of coercive interventions, uh, that is creating. If we are dealing by every time by medications and uh, that of restraint, this means that is creating of agitated level of the patients and the patient easily shifted from agitation to be aggressive. These 10 domains are supposed to be practiced very well in our practice when we, are, when we want to start to, I mean, discreting the patient. Respect personal space. You should put in our mind first that 
if we want to just clean the patient, which uh, I mean agitated patient, we should respect the space between you and your and your patient. This is with at least about two arms, two for safe of the doctor and the nurse staff, and for safe the patients also. That's number one. Don't provocate. Your interview is not a matter of provocation or argumentations or rational thinking. No, it's a matter of defining the solutions, how to solve the conflict inside the patient. So no need for provocations of a patient. Establish verbal contact. We have to say two ways, body language and verbal language. So the only way of intervention with the, with the patient is the verbal language. We should, I mean, establish uh, establish this way of a verbal contact. Uh, be concise. Of course, the patient is agitated uh, and is aggressive. Uh, if we are talking too much with the patient, uh, it means we lost our goal. Uh, be concise that the patient is agitated, there is a cause of agitation, and I need to solve the, the, that cause, and I need to calm him down. Uh, so be concise. During agitation, <coughs> the attention and the concentration of the patient is minimum. So he has no ability to concentrate and to maintain the concentrations with you during the interview. So be concise with your patient during talk. Identify the ones of feeling. The ones of feeling of the therapist, psychiatrist, and the ones of feeling, I mean staff or doctor, and also the ones and feeling of the patients. We should clarify. What do you want from your patient? I want from him to come down. What's your feeling? I'm feeling calm. That's why I need to transmit my feeling and my wants to my patient. And what the patient wants, wants number one, two, three, four, we can detect in during history. And what's his feeling? He's feeling sad, he's feeling angry, he's feeling aggressive, he's feeling anxious, he's feeling agitated. So know what the patients feel and know what the patients, I mean, wants and to try to solve these wants and this feeling. Listen closely to what the patient is saying. Of course, if you are not listening to the patient, the routine interview in psychiatry is one of the good signs or one of the good, I mean, items is to be a good listener to your patient. This is in a normal way, I mean, of evaluation of a psychiatric patient. In case of agitation, you should be more listening to your patient. Otherwise, he feels that you didn't respect him. He may be, I mean, escalating more and more. Him. Agree or agree to disagree, we can say that if the patient having something which he, you can agree with him, for example, something which is true. He is aggressive, for example, because the nurse staff gave him try to take some samples of, of blood samples, but he failed. He tried one and two and three, the interest of the patient is became agitated and tense and anxious because you try several times and you hurt me and you couldn't take the blood sample. What can I do now? This is a true. And that's why the patient is angry. And we should accept this, I mean, true peace. And we can handle it this true way to overcome the agitation of things. For example, we can agree with him for, for some principles. One of the principles in an in interview that you should respect the patient. If the patient feels that you didn't respect him, what, what he will do, he will become aggressive, he will become agitated because you didn't respect him. This is the impression given to the patient by the therapist or by the nurse staff. What can we do? This is the truth. We should accept this principle and we should, I mean, try to overcome this, uh, I mean, uh, respect principle uh, to the patient. Lay down the law and you said, yes, we are, we are working in the hospital. We have rules, we have law, and we should respect this law, we should respect the rules. Sometimes the patients or the family did not respect the rules and the law of the hospital. And that's why they are, they are coming uh, to be aggressive. For example, in, in, if the patient he didn't come in his appointment, he will take only two to four weeks medications. Sometimes the family or the patient is coming and aggressive and he wants two months or sometimes six months medication, which against the rule of the hospital. What is the end? Agitation and attacking nurses stuff and attacking the doctor. So we should respect that this is the rule and we should respect it and we should, I mean, um, interview the patient to, to know this is the rules. This rules, it's not by you, it's not by me, it's the rules of the place, it's the rules of the ministry, and we should respect these rules, fair. otherwise you cannot reach your point. Uh, over a choice and optimism, yes, an interview, don't close the interview. Don't give only one solution. The patient is coming agitated because he has only one solution, fair, and he didn't think others. And fair. If you're giving him a choice to solve his problems, fair, in, of course, you cannot get that, but you cannot get another things and this and this, and there's a lot of choice, fair. You open his mind, you decrease his anger, you're escalating him because there's another choice you can take in the 
The brief and ask the patient and the staff, yes, we should take history and asking the patients and taking more and more, I mean, uh, questions to understand the situations exactly. We will see here video. This video com composed of two parts. One is the bad handling of the patient and the second one is good handling to see what's the difference after training by experts. This is about five minutes and the second one is about five minutes. Someone's been in my bedroom cupboard and I know who it was and they took it. I want a doctor. What's the matter, Ben? I've just been, been on leave seeing my mum, haven't I, right? And I come back and I've gone to my wardrobe and, and, and my phone's been nicked and I know he's taken it. I know he has. Okay, you're going a bit too fast for me, Ben. Why don't you sit down and take a seat? I don't want to sit down. I want him to give me my phone back. He's, he's taking it to wind me up. Who took it? Philip. Philip. How do you know he took it? Have you got any proof? I know what he's like. He's always nicking stuff and I'm going to fucking do him. He Did took you it. see him take it? Did you see him? go anywhere near your cupboard. I've been with my mum, haven't I? I mean, he had three hours. That's when he must have done it. Well, did any of the other patients see him take it? I think we should ask first of all, don't you? I, I, I don't know. Have you looked anywhere else apart from your cupboard? Look, he took it. I know he has, and I want him to give it back. And if he doesn't give it back, I'm going to do him, and I'm going to smash his place up. Well, let's just ask the other patients first to see if anyone's seen it. No, did fucking you take way. It I know he... Let me finish. I was about to say, did you take it home with you? I didn't take it out. Look, Ben, you're most probably upset because your leave's over. Lots of people... No, I'm fucking not. Philip's got my fucking phone. But you don't know that, do you? Don't tell me what I fucking know what That's I've done. That's not what I'm trying to say. Yeah, what are you trying to say then exactly? Look, I'm just... Don't touch me! Look, calm down! No, you calm down! Oh, this is ridiculous. What? I've had my mobile stolen. You think I'm lying? Is that it? Is it? That's one way of dealing with agitated patient. And the end result is the patient attacked the staff. And I don't know what happened after that. So we can ask ourselves, what are the bad, I mean, behavior that uh, of staff I don't know he's a psychiatrist or a nurse. What he did, what the bad things he did with the patients. That's why the patient is escalating and agitation became more and more till the degree that he attacked the staff. I try to take some, I mean, picture to see and doing like a comment. For example, he's sitting like this and the patient coming from outside and the staff is sitting. He did not respect and he's talking to the staff, to the patients while he's sitting. And it is easily, I mean, for the, for the, for the, the patient to attack the staff. And he's looking at him by this way. The patient, highly sensitive. He can, I mean, perceive anything in a wrong way, not in a proper way. That's why we should be careful. This one of the practice, how to deal with aggressive patient. Like this way also. I don't know if he perceived the patient as escalating and more angry or no. But the way should be avoided. This is another way of body language we should be avoided during an interview. He's doing like this with him. What does it mean for the patient? When I talk to someone and doing like this and sitting, what does it mean? That you are not respecting my talk. What do you expect from the patient? more aggressions and more escalations and more, I mean, aggressive behavior. It's a matter of, of signals. If you use your finger and pointing to the patients like this way, no one can accept like this way of body language. In case of patients, it will be more and more, I mean, badly accepted from him. Okay, now he's easily attacked him because the space is closed. There's no safe for, the, I mean, the staff or the doctor. That's why he's easily attacked and um, like what happened with me <laughs> in OPD. So the distance between the, the I mean, uh, the staff and the patient. If it is close, it's easily to, to reach him. But if the distance is at least, as we said, to Armies, it is so easy to defend yourself and to be unsafe. 
okay after training of this I mean stuff what he did Someone's been in my bedroom cupboard right now. I know it was, and they took it out. I want to get, I want to see a doctor. What's the matter, Ben? I've just been on leave seeing my mum, haven't I? And I've just come back. I went straight to my cupboard, right? And someone has taken my mobile. He's been in there, and he's taken my mobile. I know he has. So who took it, Ben? But Philip. Philip. Did you see him take it? Well, how could I? I was on leave, wasn't I? Of course, of course. Uh, what sort of mobile was it? Um, it's um, a Nokia, and it's got a camera. I only just got it. A Nokia? You must be really angry, right? Yeah, well, I didn't want to come back anyway, right? But I do, and I see him as always nip my mobile, right? And I've had it up to fucking here. Yeah, I can imagine. Listen, um, why don't we find somewhere to sit down and we can work out how best to get your mobile back, yeah? Well, yeah, but we can't just sit down. We've got to go talk to Philip. Why don't you come with me? We'll find somewhere quiet to sit down and talk to no, him. But, no, but... No, we've got to go back. We've got to go and talk to Philip and look in his cupboard. Yeah. He's nicked it. It's the best thing. But I'm, I'm just I didn't taking want... him into the quiet room. We need to go and talk to Philip. Let's have a seat, Ben. I don't want to see. I don't want to see. Okay, Ben, I'm going to sit down. Are you going to join me? <laughs> we won't be interrupted here. So tell me what happened. Well, it's like I said, right? I'm on leave and I'm seeing my mum, and then I come back here and I go in my cupboard and my mobile's gone. And right, and everything else has been like trash. I mean, for fuck's sake, you do not muck about with other people's cupboards. It's just wrong. Quite right, Ben. Your cupboard is yours and yours alone. <laughs> Listen. This might sound like a stupid question, but I've got to ask it. Oh. Are you definitely sure you left your mobile in the cupboard? Yeah, I don't take it out in case I lose it. Okay, okay. And you were saying you thought that Philip took it? Yeah, yeah, to wind me up. He's always winding me up. What made you think it was Philip? Because I know what he's like. Okay, have you spoken to him? I don't know, I couldn't find him. Okay, we can speak to him later. Did you need your phone now for a particular reason? Um. Did you need to call someone? Um, no. But my mum might have texted me. Right. So we need to get your phone back as soon as possible, don't we? Yeah. Do you want to call your mum? You can use the phone here. Um, no. Okay. So how long were you on leave for? Um, uh, three hours. And was it just with your mum? Yeah. So what did you do? Um, we went for something to eat. Okay. And what did you have to eat? What was that? Um, I had, um... Steak pie and chips, and then I had um, but chocolate brownie. Was it good? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was really good, yeah. So you had a good time then, did you? Yeah, but it's only three hours, isn't it? Do you wish you had longer? <laughs> yeah, of course. So how do you feel about being back here now, then? <laughs> Pissed off. I can imagine. Lots of people find it quite hard coming back here after they've been on leave. Yeah. But what about my phone, though? Good point. I tell you what, I don't know if it's right to confront Philip yet until we've had a good look for your phone. Do you agree? I bet he's done it. We'll do our best to find your phone for you. First of all, let's double check and make sure it's not hidden somewhere. Is that a good plan? I suppose so, yeah. Well, where do you suggest that we look first? Um, uh, I could take you to my cupboard. That's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> So what were you wearing when you went out with your mum? Did you have your coat on? Uh, yeah, my black coat. Um, yeah. Uh, it'd be great if it's in your coat, eh? Yeah, it's not going to be there. Okay, it's ended. So the duration is about maybe five minutes. <coughs> five minutes interview with the staff and the aggressive or agitated patient. The interview that is calming and discreeting the patient. Here, three things are, are changed. First, the interview between the staff and the patient. Second, the, the, the way that uh, the staff used. Third is the environment. Environment is changed. There's big area, big space. I mean, the exit is not locked. And safety, just only two chairs. And the interview is free and under observation of a psychiatrist. Uh, the good thing is that the staff did it, that he is relaxed. He's not aggressive as before. He's relaxed when dealing with the patient. Second, that he's taking everything in serious. Serious looks doesn't mean angry look, no. It means that I'm interesting with your, I mean, attitude and your 
uh, you as a patient. Uh, and good eye contact, but not to, not to the degree of steering group. Uh, attentive and focus on the patient. Yes, to help him, you should be attentive. And avoid raised, as we did before, or closed eyes. And hand down, it's not like this as before. He is putting his hand down to respect him and at the same time to defend himself if there's something happening. For him. And wait equally if he's staying like this, not sitting as before. It's easily attacked when he's sitting like this, but it is standing there. And even the way between the patient and, and the staff to sit, it should be, I mean, diagonal attitude with about three to five feet away distance from the patient. The behavior, as we said, be careful. The patient, agitated patients, look into you as a mirror. If you are as a mirror and you're looking himself through you, if you are a calm, he will be calm. If you're not a calm, if you are not a calm and taking, I mean, something in a short and listening, but the language is not run away, he will be more and more irritable and agitated. Your facial, facial expressions and relax your body, which is one of the infected behavior to the patient, agitated patient, if you are in this, uh, your facial expressions and in this relaxed attitude. Uh, Non-defensive posture, yes, as we said here, relax and minimizing gastrointestinal pacing and signs of nervousness and decreased agitation. All of these are, and even mediated device, which is uh, trained, how, uh, I mean, trained ourselves as regards the body language when we are dealing with agitated patient. Your response to his talk, it's not a matter only of, of, of body language, it's a matter of interview and your response. He is talking and you're responding. You're responding by what? Responding by treating with dignity and respect him or you will not respect and argumentative and escalating and challenging the patient. Encouraging cooperation for some the patient, agitated patient is not cooperative. This is one of the nursing reports that the patient is not cooperative. Now I try to encourage him to be cooperative with me. If he is cooperative, he can respond to me and he can, I mean, I can control him. Validated feelings and repetition of the founders and rules. And we should respect these founders and rules between me and the patients and the rules of the place. It's one of things which needs to be repeated with the patient to respect the environment and respect the rules. The environment, the first one, it is closed, short environment. But the second one, it is, I mean, good space. And the distance between the doctor and the, and the patient, the exit, of, uh, it doesn't supposed to be not blocked. And ask the patients for helping him where to, to, I mean, for example, he needs water, he wants to stop, I mean, uh, the interview for sometimes, you can sit down, no need to talk with me, or talking, I mean, you need to talk with me, or stand, you can sit down and take some breaths like this. Try to open the mind of the patients as we can to deviate his attention from the angry state to be in relaxed state. And you should aware for the place. If you don't know the, the exit and the entrance and the place of the office or clinic, you can easily attack by aggressive patient. One of the techniques that you are not coming from outside to the patients and talking to him without identifying yourself. It's one of ABC in, 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 in psychiatry. And we can do it with, uh, with every patient. So in agitated patient, you should identify yourself and introduce yourself and identify what's your purpose, why you're here, and what you want from, from patient. And to take a history. Because agitated patient, there is a risk of factors for personality disorder, borderline, and the social personality disorder, addict, addictivation, schizophrenia, in, in, in psychotic due to delusions or hallucinations, bipolar, impulsivity, there is panic disorder, many things, and many psychiatric disorders can be associated with agitation. How can we know the background of this agitation from the history? In a short time, we can take in some points of history to help us to, to managing patients. Reflection. You should reflect. It's not a matter that the vision is talk and you, be, you passively receive. No, you should reflect your impression. If you don't understand, tell him that I'm confusing. I need to help you. And can you tell me again? I understand that, you're, that you need one, two, three. I'm right or no? If I'm right, okay. If I'm not right, try to correct my understanding. And as we said, verbal communications and to be concise. And if we train to well, trust yourself that you can manage your patient. If you cannot trust yourself, you cannot manage your patient. Some instructions, 
Yes, don't threat. No need for threatening or argumentations or try to, to, to give a, a rational thinking and, and reasons why what happens, why it is happening, why the nurse staff is doing like this, why, why, I, because of, because of, because of. The patient has not accepted these rationalizations and he will be more and more, uh, I mean, angry. Uh, the boundaries and rules, it's very important when you are talking with agitation patient to know that this is out of my hand out of the hand of the nurse staff, out of the hand of psychiatrists, that is a rule. And we should follow and to make this, uh, this rules. If the questions from the patient is just, I mean seeking questions and asking for something, yes, respond. But if the question is attacking questions, no, don't respond. Try to talk in other things. Because if you are responding to the attacking questions, he may be escalating more and more. Give a choice, yes. For safe alternatives, if the patient, for example, has one choice in his mind and he is angry because of this and he is not, uh, he is not able to take this, you can give him another choice. So prepare your mind perfectly how to give him a multiple and alternative choices to make him also calm. For example, you frightened me when you PSP. Can you please sit down or I come back after you for some time when you come down? It's a multiple of a choice. It's not only for that I want to talk with you, complete to talk with me. No, there's no time. Give him another choice to be, I mean, relaxed. Yes, be interested about his feeling because so that feeling, that's one of the, I mean, cause of that. The problem in agitations, as any other psychiatric disorder, that's a problem in the mind, in the thinking, conception. He has a concept, abnormal or unusual thinking. That's why it's affect two things, his behavior and his feeling. That's why he is, his feeling is, is, is bad and his behavior is bad. We don't want from him to be escalating to the behavior. We just want from him to overcome this bad feeling. So be concentrated about the feeling of the patient. Focus on a cognition, yes, because any aggression it is due to abnormal cognitive uh, thinking in the mind. If you can detect it, it's easily solving three things, cognitions or thinking and also feeling and the behavior. Uh, agree with the uh, agreement, yes, if the vision has a right as regard to truth or as regard to principle or consensus, yes, you should agree with him. Otherwise, he will look into you as you are lying to me. If you are not true and you are not honest with me if, and the relationship it will be bad or sometimes uh, inappropriate re uh, relationship. So, after finishing all of this, what, what exactly we need? We need this technique. Who are eligible for this technique? The nursing staff and the doctor. How can, yes, we need some experts to, to train us about these new techniques, how to deal with the situation vision. Why? Because we have goals. We need, we need to reduce the number of admission. We need to reduce medications. We need to reduce, I mean, restraint. We need to increase the quality of the surface of the patient's pain. It's one of the quality indicators, or I mean, improving indicators of the hospital, of our surface. Pain. Verbal discretion is very important. Pain. To summarize it, it's very important. It's better. We can using it in more than two thirds of agitation patients. Just only one third of agitation patients can be treated by restraint and by uh, admissions and level one observations and medication. Thank you very much. <clears throat>